Yo, what is going on everybody? It's your boy Marshall live and I am live and we are back with another recording of the Marshall Gillen Show. I am Marshall Gillen, the founder of TopPaidSpeaker.com where we're teaching experts and entrepreneurs how to turn their mess into a message and a full-time career earning $10,000 to $100,000 per month. I know that sounds crazy, but literally, if you have a high income skill in today's market, we can show you how to sell it with public speaking. And we are back with today's episode with another expert speaker, another expert entrepreneur and a visionary and a new good friend of mine, but somebody I wanna introduce you to because you know here on The Marshall Gillen Show, I am going out there and connecting you to people with high income skills who have taken those skills and completely changed their life. And now they're not only using those skills to live the life of their dreams, to create the impact of their dreams, but they're going out and they're helping the world be better, empowering them, inspiring them, teaching them how to turn high income skills into the life of their dreams. Today's guest is no exception to the amazing people that we have on. Today I'm bringing on entrepreneur, visionary, and broker owner and managing partner of Glacier Country Remax. My new good friend, Mark Beck, do me a favor. Give me some likes, give me some love. Let Mark know that you appreciate him having you on. And hey, if you haven't subscribed to the show yet, make sure you do leave us a review as we add Mark here. I'm excited to talk to him. I was just on his show a couple days ago. Uh, we are, it was the first day of the blizzard here in Montana. Yo, bro. I'm here. Hey, what's up, it. man? <laughs> it was it was kind of a blizzard it was uh it was cold this morning dude well what i was just saying when i when i came and recorded a podcast in your studio last week it was the first day of the blizzard my it was like the first snow and it was like yeah. the, it was a blizzard yeah it was it was wicked it, you know thankfully we weren't snowing today but it's uh I, i'm saying it's february in november so yeah, it's uh, wild I love it. I love it. <laughs> Dude, thir 13 years in San Diego, and, and it's, uh, this is now my third winter here in Montana. And I was telling my fiance, Kirstie, which who you know, and we'll talk about in a second. But I was telling Kirstie, I was like, babe, I can't do this anymore. Like, I can't, I don't think I can be here in Montana anymore. And then I went to add you on this Facebook page, and I saw your pictures from, uh, from South America, from Brazil. And I was like, <laughs> I gotta get out of here, man. But no, for real, dude, I know you're a busy dude and it's, uh, it's truly an honor to have you here. Tell the listeners where you're tuning in from. Yeah, yeah, I'm tuning in from my podcast studio. Uh, the podcast is Selling Montana. I have a studio in my office at Remax Glacier Country right here at Six Sunset Plaza in Kalispell, Montana. It is uh, an awesome little shop we got here. Uh, we yeah. produce a podcast basically bi-weekly uh, about business, entrepreneurship, and real estate. Yeah. And that's really how we got connected and got you on the show is that we know each other from the community, which we're going to get into today. But having an opportunity to go in there, I was telling you, Mark, but my listeners will know from just watching the show, if you guys go watch the one that the episode I did with Mark and his uh, co-hosts, I was like, I've never been in a studio and I've recorded like hundreds of podcast episodes. I always do them from my phone. So I felt big ball at man. But what you guys got going on over there is very, very cool. I appreciate your time. And I appreciate you being here, dude. I don't know how much you know about the show, but what we talk about, man, is I like to connect with game changers who are out there making a difference in the world, who are building the reality of their dreams, but who maybe didn't come from that background. So before we get into kind of where you came from, how you developed or, or got into real estate, how you became rookie of the year, and then and now you're a broker owner. Before we get into all that, I want to know a little bit like, did you always know about real estate and have an understanding of it? Was there somebody in your family? Or did you, like, how did you start out? Like, how did real estate even come into little Mark's mind in the beginning? <laughs> Uh, I did not always know about real estate. My dad was a realtor. He was a Remax agent for a few years when I was a teenager. Um, he was more, he was really more into doing his own stuff, building and flipping. Um, he was not super successful. And part of that was his timeline when he started was, you know, in early mid two thousands. And then of course he left the business after the 2008 recession. Right. Um, you know, and so, and that, and that was actually the time when we moved to Montana and my dad did not enter real estate again. Um, wow. And so I had a little bit of a, a an under, not an understanding, but I'd seen it, you know, I had seen real estate. I had seen my dad sell building homes, but you know, selling homes, et cetera. Um, but he was, I would not call him a, a wealthy man. He was kind of always robbing Peter to pay Paul and trying yeah. to like get a business going, you know? Yeah. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Well, I think that a lot of entrepreneurs go through that phase, not just like watching our parents if they were, but especially, you know, I'm 38, we're in the same generation. It's like, I think a lot of entrepreneurs do struggle. Like they, they have this idea that they can use entrepreneurship to go out and create freedom. But if you guys have ever read the book, The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, you'll know like a lot of us think that we can run our own business because we have a skill, but there's a difference between having a skill and being able to run and build and sustain a business. And I think that like a lot of people just don't understand that. And so one of the things I love about what, you know, coming across what you guys are doing, Mark, is like, I know a lot of realtors, right? I know a lot of real estate investors. I know a lot of brokers, but what you're doing in creating the conversation online for more people to have access to what it means to have a high income skill, as we like to say, like, I think it's incredible. And, and you know, I was also on your Facebook timeline. I saw that old video from Tom Vu. Like, that guy was yeah. killing it in the, in the <laughs> marketing game back in the 90s, man. Uh, if you guys have it, if you guys want to know what we're talking about, go to Mark's page. You guys can find this really funny video from uh, he shared from 1990s of this basically uh, infomercial. But what I want to say to this, Mark, is like you, you talk about having an example sort of from your dad, but then you became a realtor. You got into it. Did you work any other jobs in between or did you like graduate oh, yeah. Montana? And Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So my first initial thought of like, oh, I want to get into real estate, I was uh, just grad, I was just graduating as a senior in high school. I was going through a really rough time uh, at the time with my family and my parents. And I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness and uh, I was excommunicated from that religion and uh, was being ostracized by my, all my friends and family. Uh, I was walking home from my job at Five Guys Burgers and Fries. My, wow. my 1993 Cadillac Sedan DeVille was broken down. <laughs> so I was walking home and I found in the ditch I found a book written by Robert Kiyosaki, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. You're in the ditch? In the ditch. And Bro, this was around Christmas time. I graduated high school early, so this was in December. And it's, it's uh, I can't remember who's written it. I still have the book. I've carried it with me this whole time. But it was gifted to him in 2009. And it was obviously like some sort of gift, like a Christmas gift or something. And they said, hey, let's collaborate on this uh, and talk about it as a family. And I believe, I think they tossed it out the window and I found that book lying in the, in the ditch in Stillwater uh, Estates right next to Glacier High School. I was walking wow. home to my grandma's house. That's and wild. that's how I got into real estate. I, I read that book. I'd never been exposed to anything like that before. And it changed the way that I thought about money. Now, I didn't like perfectly take these skills and take that discipline at 18. Like it took time through my 20s, but... I've read that book many times over, you know, the last over a decade now, and I always take something new from it every time I read it. 100%. I've carried it with me through every job, every career change, everything, and, uh, and, I, and I'll look back and reflect, and it's like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I'm not doing this. I'm not doing that. But the biggest thing is to treat money as what it is. It's a tool. It's a medium of trade. It's a tool. And so you have to view money like that. And money is a tool to buy assets, not, not to buy toys and all that. That comes later. When you have assets, then you can fund your toys. But that's, that was the biggest thing for me, which is super hard. It takes a ton of discipline yeah. to not buy a brand new truck yeah. or a snowmobile. Oh, oh, dude, for sure. <laughs> which we can get into that first off. But dude, that is an amazing story. I had, I had no idea how that started. And at this point, my entrepreneur journey, um, I know that book intimately, right? But yeah. uh, it's a game changer. So for anybody who's, does it, who wants to know what we're talking about, you can Google it. You can go to Amazon. I suggest getting it ASAP if you've never read it. It's called Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I cannot spell that for you, but if you type in Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it will come up. But okay, so let's get into that because there's a lot of different variables I would love to go in from there. One is if you ever choose to have a career in speaking, bro, like that is your story that you start talking from is that point. Like that is because I love to give tips to my speakers out there. I'm like, dude, if you have a story like Mark's, like that is that is the story. Also, because being excommunicated from Jehovah's Witness, I've had clients in the past who have done that, who have leveraged that in the speaking career. So I know how like that if for our listeners who don't understand, like that's a big deal. I mean, basically, every, every single thing you know about life is done it, yeah it is done yeah and it's very it's very hard to um convey that to other people unless they grew up maybe as mormons or or, or if they grew up as jehovah's witnesses then they know it thoroughly uh and then uh you know and, and then people that get close to me and associate with me and i tell them about my experiences and not all of my experiences were bad with jehovah's witnesses right a lot of 
a lot of the sales training that I had and why people, you know, my competitors can't really duplicate what I do is because I grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. Mm. I went door knocking every wow. Saturday. My parents, right. me. like I've done things that, that in, in life at such a young age that no one has done. That's wild. You know? <laughs> dude, so let, let's talk about that for a second because like, again, like you're saying, dude, I mean, the way that I understand it, I mean, your family has to, it has to say goodbye to you because they, they can no longer, like they can no longer talk to you. The people you grew up with, it's like, it's this very isolated, like, okay, so are you already making this transition when you find the book in the ditch or are you in the process of thinking about it or is it not even on the radar yet? It, it really wasn't on the radar yet. I was just in a ton of trouble. Yeah. Uh, and I, I don't know how much we need to go into that story or anything like that because it's pretty personal, but um, it was just some, it was, I definitely felt like I was mistreated through that by the organization and the, yeah. and the elders and, and all that. But, but uh, man, it was a fantastic learning experience, yeah. and, you know, to uh, feel like you're losing everything. And I eventually did come back to Jehovah's Witnesses and, and, you know, I got my family back in my twenties and, and then ultimately I did leave again. You know, I, I, I no longer attend their churches and yeah. I don't profess. I celebrate all the holidays and I, yeah. I live normal life, you know? Yeah. Well, no, I love that. And I appreciate you opening up and being vulnerable and sharing that with our audience here because everybody that has seen me over the last six to seven years knows like my tagline is your message, your message. And I, that, when I learned that, when I heard that quote for the first time back in 2016, it, it changed my life forever. It gave me permission to be like, Oh shit. So you're telling me like the craziest thing I've ever been through is actually a message I can use to go out and empower other people. And so when I learned that, you know, that's been the crux of everything that we've built online over the last few years. And so again, not to push too much, it's just like, I appreciate it because what's important to the viewers I, and what the, why I make this show is because I always say like the details of our stories are different, but at the end of the day, if like you feel, you know, exiled and I feel exiled, it's still the same emotion. And I think a lot of people, you know, and I think you would agree, like, sometimes we just need permission from somebody yes. else to do the things we want. And so that's why I want to stop and not just gloss over that part. So I'm like, okay, cool. Like, this dude is clearly in the middle of going through something. He stumbles across a book, which if you guys have watched me for a while, you know that I believe that books are mentors. They're basically a consultant. It's a consultant in a book. And so I'm like, you stumble across this mentor in a book form, Robert Kiyosaki, with this foundational idea, this transformational idea. So at that point, then what, what did that teach you? Like, where, what did you start to develop about money that you were able to leverage as, as into an entrepreneur? Because most people, even adults still to this day, struggle with money mindset or wealth blueprint. So what was it that changed for you? And how did that impact you going forward? Uh, the way I, I looked at money and purchasing, wanting to purchase assets, I'm like, I know I need to, uh, you know, it's not about how much you make, it's about how much you keep and how am I gonna get myself leveraged? Debt is good, right? And my parents right. always taught me debt is bad. No, debt is good. You just have to be able to manage it. And the type of debt is kind of, a lot of people lose that in translation. Uh, credit card debt is terrible, right? And I've had, I've been in positions in my life where I had credit card debt, you know, uh, I've had, up, I think I was at like seventy, eighty thousand dollars in credit card debt, and I got it all paid off. And and I and I was using that credit card debt as an investment. You know, I was I was putting stuff on credit cards like marketing when I first got into real estate. So I was investing in myself. But but like buying things, status. That's what I say. Status, right? Buying shit you don't need with money you can't afford yeah. to spend. Right? right. That's the definition of status for me. Yeah. So. I mean, I drive a four, I drive a four or five year old car. It's paid for. Yeah. I could drive a brand new truck or a brand new Range Rover. I right. don't need to. Right. <laughs> so changing that, changing that mindset is, is, is really it. And just adopting that. And you're not going to feel, you're not going to feel bad. Like you're not going to, you're going to feel, you're going to sleep so much better at night having money in the bank and options and not having monthly payments. Yeah. Uh, and then using that money to go buy another piece of property. Yeah. Uh, buy another piece of, you know, whether it's land or multifamily, buy an apartment complex or a new home, uh, you're going to sleep way better at night. hundred percent. Well, let's get into that because that's exactly what I'm teaching my boys right now. Um, I have a 10 and 13 year old son here at home. And so we've been talking about assets and liabilities. I'm like, okay, boys. So this is what an asset is. And this is what a liability is. And so everywhere we go and everything we do, I'm always asking, is that an asset or is that a liability? Is that going to 
cost you something or is it an investment that's going to cash flow money back to you? Because that's what we're Correct. really after, right? How can I take the cash I have now and invest it in something that's going to cash flow back to me? And then how can we repeat that time and time again? And I think that's like what a lot of people, I mean, we're not taught that in school. So no. it's like last night we took, I took Josh to Target and we bought candy. I was like, sit down last. I was like, what, what can you sell at school, dude? I'm like, I'm not saying that you need to go make money, but I'm like, why are you not making money at school? And he's like, yeah. And so I'm like, what can we sell? And we ran through everything, dude. But he was like, let's do boxes of candy. So we went and bought a bunch of units at $1.29 and we did the math. He's going to sell them each at three bucks. And I'm like, this is how much money you're going to make. So today's his first day going out there and starting to flip this thing. But I love that, you know, because we're not taught that really growing up. Nobody's really taught about how to use money as a leverage or OPM. Other people's money. Other people's money, exactly. Yeah. And most people think, and you know, it's very common misconception that your home is an asset. Your home, your home is truly a liability. If it Absolutely. costs you money every month, it's a liability. Yeah. You know, and I, and it's like people will argue till the cows come home on that. It's I never call anything an asset unless I'm getting paid every month. By it. No, that's the rule. And that's such an aid that like, like in the investment community or in the real estate community, right? That is like one of the back and forth. It's like, oh, should you own your home or should you rent your home? The circles that I run with, the people I run with, they all rent their homes. Like they all, you know, it's like some sort of a lease or a rent, like on these multi-million dollar homes and people are confused by it. But the ability to walk away from that and not have anything is like the, the value for me that I'm investing in so I can put it in other properties that cash flow back to me. And, um, I, so I, and I'm, I'm super weird. I, I moved out of my home put it on Airbnb. I moved into my parents upstairs loft. And so my home paid for itself for this year. Dude, I don't but, people but that's the sacrifice, right? Like, <laughs> but, but, but then again, is the sacrifice because I don't want to get too far off the subject of money because there's some things I want to dive into here for our listeners. But if you look at how people, how we evolved from like, I mean, from the primal days, you didn't like grow up and be like, all right, peace out family. Like I'm leaving. Like, no, it was a tribe. You all stayed together. You lived together. The caves, the villages, it was all together. And so, I know that like in this modern day society of Western culture, really, we've been taught and indoctrined to believe that if you live with your parents, that you're less than because really yeah. then the system can't plug you in as a cog because if they can't prey off your status, then, you know, and so I don't think that's weird. And the people that listen to this podcast, like, dude, I'm trying to build a big enough house. My boys never have to leave. You know what I'm saying? They, yeah, I hear you. And, and there's nothing wrong with being weird. Like being weird is usually good. You probably don't want to do what everyone else is doing. <laughs> I mean, they're probably broke, right? Well, like, dude, 100% <laughs> and broke in multiple ways, not just in their bank account. But let's exactly. talk about that. Because I, this is awesome that we can have a conversation about this because a lot of people are broke. And a lot of people, they want to make more money, but they just don't because they look at it, they look at their life and they say, okay, well, you know, I have this job and make X amount of money. But that little bit of money they do have, they don't have the discipline to hold on to it, to stack yep. a few chips, to invest, and they go out and spend it. So on can you just hold and all distractions? Yeah. So yeah. I, what I want to ask you, since you're, you know, since you've created this, you have multiple businesses. I want to talk about a few of them here in a second. But can you explain to the viewers who may not understand, like what what would you consider high income skills, or what are skills that people can develop to change their life? Like what are people missing out on, and why do they stay stuck, broke for their whole life? Like why do you think that is? Uh, no one has sales skills ha anymore, hardly at all. Sales is the number one skill you will need in life because everything in life is a negotiation, right? Everything in life, whether it's a raise, whether it's anything, doesn't matter what you're doing. If you can't sell yourself, you, you, you're not going to do well, right? You're not going to do well in the dating world. You're not going to do well at anything. Um, I, uh, you know, I've developed sales skills. It took me a long time and it wasn't, I didn't just like read one book and then immediately there I was, I was good to go. Right. Like it's a, it's a constant learning and sales right. often changes too. And so you have to adapt to the new market. And I always say, um, you know, I, I sold cars. I used to work at Don K. I worked at Don K for about four years. Uh, I, bet you were uh, a I, car real salesman. I learned so much from oh. selling cars. That is the best that's the best. That's better than going to college. Go yeah. sell cars for four years instead yeah. of going to get your bachelor's degree. Yeah. You'll make, if you do well, you'll make six figures. You'll make a hundred grand a year plus, uh, which I did. And uh, you'll walk out of there with no debt and you'll be able to buy real estate and you'll have a new skill that you can apply to everything in life. Yeah. And I always yeah. said, I don't sell cars. I don't sell houses. 
I learned how to sell people. And when you know how to sell people, you can sell anything. 100%. Dude, I love that because I, I will argue with people, not argue, but you know, go back and forth to some of my buddies. Um, but I, I always say what we do at Top Paid Speaker, I'm like, it's the, it's the number one most valuable skill in the whole world. And people are, you know, in other industries, well, wait a second. I'm like, no, bro. Being able to sell yourself is, is the most valuable skill. But if you can sell yourself with words and communication in front of people and then you can create influence, there is absolutely nothing more valuable than the ability to create influence through communication. Like there's nothing else because every, that's, the, that's the root of everything. I'm going to sell you a house. I'm going to sell you this food. I'm going to sell you whatever. And so I, I love what you're saying, but you can't be better at sales or better influencing people unless you're willing to be uncomfortable. So you said about door knocking right? You said about what's more uncomfortable when your sales manager is pushing you out the door to go talk to the people that just like you have no choice, you're commission based. And if yeah. you don't do it, there's a 50 other applications that are on the desk that will. Yes, and so I love that you talked about that. So let's say that, um, well, let's just start with you. So tell me a little bit about how then the real estate journey starts because you start to develop this idea of what an asset versus a liability is. You're starting to have this independence as a young man and, and understanding that you live in a society where you can go out and you can create more, you can create and have these things. So where does real estate come in? Did you go and take the exam or what, how'd that start? No, 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 no. Uh, I, I literally just, I, I didn't think I was going to become a realtor. I was, I was just wanted to be an investor. And so, and like I was making a lot of money selling cars and I'm like, okay, I'm going to start buying land. And through the course of uh, searching through property, uh, and then just literally just happen chance on the dealership, I ran into Doug Denmark, uh, who oh. owned Remax Glacier Country, which I now own. Uh, and he he met me and, you know, he's in his, he's a man in his 60s and I'm a man in my you know mid 20s. And uh, he just we just bonded. He, yeah. he was like all of a sudden he just wanted to take me under my wing because I'm talking about doing multifamily stuff. I'm looking at these townhouse lots. I'm like, I'm going to build stuff. I'm going to rent, you know, be a, a landlord. And, and he's like, Mark, you're in the wrong business, man. He's like, you're, you're making six figures a year. Man, you can make seven figures a year in real estate. He's like, you need to get a real estate license. Right. And, uh, uh, and I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, I never really wanted to be a real estate agent, you right. know? And it wasn't just, any, it just wasn't something that I thought I wanted to do. But the more I started looking into it and, and talking to Doug about it, uh, I was like, you know, this is, this is fantastic. And I ended up buying you know, property through him, obviously, ended up helping some of my friends who wanted to invest in the same neighborhood that I bought. And I realized, holy crap, I am, I could be selling these properties. I could be representing these people right. and making thousands of dollars on the transaction, right. but they're coming to me for advice anyways. Right. And they're older than me. Right. And they're coming to me for financial real estate advice. Yeah. And that's when it just, it just clicked. I'm like, I'm, I'm wasting my time and leaving, leaving money on the table. Like I've got to get into the business. Dude, that, that is, first off, that's gangster as fuck, but I love <laughs> hearing that. So I want to, I, I, there's a, I want to unpack that, but there's something I don't want our more advanced listeners to skip over what you're saying. And this is what I want to expand on next is because I, I always go back and forth. I'm like, well, why would you want to be a realtor when you could just be a real estate investor? And if you were a real estate investor, then what's the point of even being a realtor? And so what I want people not, and I want to expand on that for just one second. But what I want our advanced listeners to understand is that what you're saying, Mark, is that you were this, and then you realized you needed to have this kind of a business to help you do more of this. So you figured, shit, why don't I just own that business and then work within the two businesses? And I don't think enough business owners understand that. It's like, if you're buying stuff from, a, from another company, if, if I'm a speaker, so if I'm paying another speaker agency to book me, I might as well just build my own speaker agency and book myself through that. And that's essentially what you're saying, right? Es essentially, yeah. Like if you're going to do large, larger scale projects, it, it's a big benefit for you to get a real estate license. And, and, and quite frankly, you know, state law, if you own more than three properties, uh, you're considered a real, a real estate professional. If you have more than three rental properties, really? state, you're a real estate professional and you're held accountable to all the fair housing laws, all the same laws that a property manager or realtor is, but you lack the knowledge. You don't know the laws the way that I know the laws, right? right? And so, so that's where it's a huge benefit for you to get a license, get that education, hang your, it's going to cost you money to hang yourself with a broker or whatever, yeah. but that's the cost of doing business. And honestly, how, like, do you want, how badly do you want to risk being sued? Right. And how badly yeah. do you want to lose what you've gained? You're better off just paying a little bit of money, getting the education, getting the license and, uh, and being professional about it. 
That's crazy. And it's such a really good way to look at it. And without mentioning yeah. other companies and other names of an org organizations, it's interesting as we talk about this because online recently, well, not so recently, but I've watched, we've watched the Cardones and I watch Elena Cardone, I mean, move really into promoting her as more of a realtor than yeah. anything. And I'm like, why is Elena doing that? Like you guys, that, you guys, you guys are Mr. and Mrs. 10 X. Like, why is she pushing the realtor angle now? And I, I haven't been able to understand it, but now it's making more sense. It, yeah. It's essentially like team recruiting and then building that, but it's like a downline almost. A a absolutely. And there is a level of downline. I mean, being a, you know, being a broker, I supervise all the agents. There's a, there's 11 of us total here. Uh, when I started, there was, I think we were at four when we moved into the new building. So I've more than doubled the size of my organization. Uh, and then of course there's income that's made from, you know, being supervising brokers. So uh, a little bit of a downline, so to speak. I, I, I so I, I love your outlook on it. I've, I'm actually learning a lot. So let me ask you this then, Mark. I say I'm a listener and I have a nine to five job and I'd have nothing. Let's say I have like, I don't even know, $2,500 in the bank, right? Uh, okay. So what if I want to get into real estate, how would that person approach this? Would they look at being an investor? Would they uh, go right in and get their realtor license? Like, what would you recommend? I know we're not like no financial advice here because um, we're not professional. I, well, I'm not professional. But what would you recommend for that person who's listening to this podcast? They work nine to five and they're like, bro, I need, I, I got to change this. Uh, before you go and, and, and buy real estate or get a real estate license, uh, I would say maybe come and mentor under someone like me. Uh, see if they'll let you do that. Uh, maybe look at changing your job. Maybe you can be employed at a real estate brokerage as a light, uh, getting a license, being a licensed assistant. Um, if you're if you're super ballsy, you can jump into it uh, at full blown like I did. But you you're gonna want to have more than twenty five hundred dollars in the bank. I, <laughs> right. I see that now. You'll go through that real quick. Uh, and so the the licensed assistant is not a bad move it's can it could it could probably pay you what your current job is paying you now and maybe even more so because you probably have the opportunity to earn some commissions for you know on the side too um so that that's probably a good opportunity there i don't know about i i really hate to tell people to like just jump into real estate investing just right off the bat because yeah. timing plays a lot into it and and uh uh, I really have no idea where our market's heading right yeah. now. Um, it could be about to just skyrocket or it could just continue to trend down and it could be slow. So um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure until the next quarter yeah. happens. <laughs> well, well, no, no, that makes sense. I, just, I want to give people a contrast and perspective of what we're talking about here. I do want to ask you about the recession here in a second. But, sure. what, but okay, let's talk about the other side then because I know that some people, let's say that you're the same person, you have no money, uh, well, you have twenty five hundred dollars. Yeah, you're working nine to five, but you're like, dude, I have no, I have no desire to go get a job in real estate or to be a realtor. But let's focus on this side for a second. I want to ask you a couple questions. So, investing wise, let's say that I want to get into something like wholesaling. Is that something like is that a good place to start if, to find deals with no money down, no credit, or do you recommend like saving until you can do your own rental property or your own flip? Like on that aspect, where do you think people start in investing? You know, there's there's people that make money and they they jump into it and wholesaling and a lot of that has to do with the one the market you're in like the marketplace uh, and and the timing of the market. Uh, the last few years have been an incredible upswing in the market and and I'll tell you here locally, trying to hold, be a wholesaler has been next to impossible. Trying yeah. to find a deal has been yeah. really difficult. Um, I know some people that, that do it, you know, and, and it's, it's definitely a lot of work and you're, you gotta, you gotta be willing to take on the, the contractor job too. Like if you're not a skilled, you know, skilled with, uh, labor and, and right. building and stuff like that, you can get yourself in your head real over your head really quick. Yeah. Um, because you probably don't have the opportunity to do, do a home inspection on those. So if you don't know much about homes and the, the structures, then you'll be in over your head real fast. Um, but it, it's not to say that it can't work. I don't think our market here in Flathead County has been a great place to wholesale. Yeah, yeah. It might become a great place in the near future. There might be some really good opportunities. I think that, you know, as we're trending into a buyer's market now, uh, you know, I was talking to another 
you know, really senior Remax broker, went out to lunch with him. He thinks right now is a great time to buy and sell real estate. I, I do know this, that interest rates are not going to be where they are. They never stay where they are forever. It's going to change, right? And so housing prices have come down 15%. When interest rates go back down, which they will, right. uh, you're going to have a ton of gain. But interesting. that's not... That's not, you know, wholesalers are looking for a fast flip. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. You're not looking to, if you can't, if you don't have the capacity financially to hang on to it, probably might want to bide your time. I, I, I totally agree. I, I think that's fire. And then I definitely always learning something. Let me ask you this. I have a ton of friends in the real estate investing space. Like the masterminds I've been part of, like that's what they do. But they're in markets like North Carolina and Ohio and Tennessee and, and you know, places like this. Why is it that all of my friends, you know, they're talking about buying and flipping real estate. Montana is like, seems to be this booming market. Why is it that I don't see any real estate investors across the country caring about this market in general? Like, what do I don't, what don't I understand about it? Well, there are real estate investors that care about this market, but it's very, it's very in specific ways. Um, and it's either one like major big deep deep money that are doing huge projects subdivisions etc or it's more mom and pop type um i don't see a lot of the middle of the road right guys. you know people buying a house they want to a lot of my clients out-of-state clients they buy a home they want to airbnb it and then they're gonna retire and move here so yeah. like that's the type of investor i don't see you know guys that are just picking up 50 right. 60 homes as a fleet here yeah. it's just the price point on the market is just not really conducive. Okay. To it. That totally makes sense. That's totally makes yeah. sense. Cause I'm always driving around. Everything's for sale in Montana. I'm like, I don't know shit about real estate, but my, somebody else maybe should know about this, but that makes total sense, dude. Well, let me ask you, dude, how did you get into the real estate investing space in the first place? Was it a buy and flip or what, what did you do for the very first time that you got that you, what was your first investment? I bought land. I bought Smart. land and held on to it. Yeah. Uh, land, it, land is always a good investment. It doesn't matter what the market is. Land is, is it pretty much always appreciates. Sure, it goes. I mean, it goes down uh, for short periods of time, but there's they're not making any more land. You can always yeah. scrape an old house and build a new one. There's only so much land, and I'll tell you, subdivisions are getting tougher in Montana. So if you can buy bigger acreage now. Uh, I think the price point is is still really good. And, and gosh, I know 10 years from now, you're going to really love yourself and pat yourself on the back if you bought oh, land. Bet. Today. I bet. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome, man. So uh, I'm learning a lot, dude. I, I didn't know I was going to have you on about a real estate show, but uh, I should have known better. So well, let me ask you, how big was the mentorship in, in all of you learning all of this? Because you said when you started, you had Doug, right? Yep. Doug yep. became that. So a lot of people, I think, when we like it's great to talk about all this and you can go read the books and you can learn all of it, but how much harder is trying to do it on your own versus having somebody right next to you? I mean, tell, tell me a little bit about the impact of having a mentor. Oh, yeah, I mean, Doug was a key element to my success. I would not be here without him. Uh, Doug was like, a, ended up being like a father. I mean, him and I, we go hunting together. We do stuff together. We rode dirt bikes together. He's he's 70 now, so he's it's not quite as conducive on yeah. him and he had some health problems, but but yeah, Doug was like a father to me. And man, if you can find like, if you can find an old dog who's willing to give you his time, yeah, take you take it. Like oh, yeah. the most important use of your time in your twenties, early twenties, mid twenties, thirties, learning from older people. Like find people in their sixties that you can connect with. You know, yeah. Uh, and and if they'll give you their time and take you under their wing, just cherish every moment of it because uh it's it's a key element to why i'm sitting here dude that's amazing i i love when, i just love hearing people's out or um you know their outtake on a mentorship i mean again it's one of those things that seems so obvious to us now but back growing up or even when i was in my 30s i still i mean in my early 30s i still didn't even really understand what a mentor was and then now i look back i'm like how could i have gotten this far in life without understanding mentorship let me ask you about this company that you that you've created because you actually are a property manager too and you created a company called wonderless property management so tell me a little bit about that like where does where does that come into the picture do i have to have like am i my like deep deep daddy pockets when i do that or like tell me a little bit about how you get something like that going and what is wonderless 
you know, uh, so Wanderlust Montana Property Management was is was just an idea that uh, Stephanie and and Megan and I came up with, and and you know you don't have to have deep daddy pockets to do it. You just got to have great partners, uh, people that you like, know, and trust, and can work with, and and uh, you guys all you all help each other out. And um, my most successful businesses have been partnerships. Wanderlust is becoming successful. Remax, you know, I, I am partners with Doug. Him and I are 50-50 owners. Uh, I don't necessarily want to be a sole owner because I don't want to be the one yeah. just holding the bag there all the time. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so, you know, Wanderlust was just, we were selling so many properties uh, and so many were like vacation rental or investment properties that were like, having to give refer out management you know because we're realtors and, and you can ma manage property as a realtor you can sell and manage property a property manager cannot sell real estate so the real estate license is definitely the one to get in my in my opinion yeah yeah uh, it opens the most doors yeah and uh interesting so so we we were just looking at the money rolling out the door and it's like man these guys like these property managers they're way overbooked there's not enough of them and most of them aren't even that good and like no other realtors are competing with us really. Uh, and you know, cause it's your supervising broker has to allow you to do it. And I'm, well, I'll allow myself and my, my agents to do it. You know, it's just that simple. I, I got myself in the position of power to do so. And, and, uh, so we decided we spent a year researching it, uh, talking about it. We, I, I, when I went to broker owner training, when I bought into the franchise in Denver, I met a, a, a broker who had just purchased a Remax franchise, a big one from Texas. He had just sold his property management company. And I'm like, hey, I'm just looking at getting into this, man. Like, can you give me some advice? Dude, he, he opened the door for us. He gave wow. me his old contracts for yeah. free. Met, spent a couple hours with us on the phone. And he, you know, him and I, we just were, good buddies when we were in Denver for the week that we were there, right. Go to dinner and drinks and all that. And it's like, we're friends on Facebook still. And I mean, it was just super easy. And that was yeah. my, my secret weapon is I yeah. had from another market, a guy that had a thousand plus rentals yeah. uh, and sold his company for seven figures, another mentor, right? Like just walk you through it. Dude, so <laughs> it's wild. I mean, people really, I know it's cliche in the entrepreneur world or online world, but your network is your net worth. It's literally like, yeah. I'm, I tell people all the time, like that's why I host these masterminds and these events. I'm like, all the business that you do for the year is built inside of these little events or these things that you can go to because that's where the real relationships are built. And then it's like, oh, yo, let me open my entire book to you. Oh yeah, I know Mark. I met him at so-and-so. Yeah, Mark, yo, come out. You know what I'm saying? Um, but that aside, what's interesting about what you were just saying, dude, is now I got up. Now I'm wondering, dude, is I'm like, I'm hearing you talk about how to start a property management company with partners. And I'm thinking like, why is Mark not selling like a little weekend, like consulting package for 25 K <laughs> a pop where you invite like four or five people out to the office. You do like a deep dive for like two days. This is how you launch it and start it. This is how you make it profitable. You have a whole nother well, six figure business right there, dude. Well, well, I might, and I might get that going. I, I, I definitely want to purchase another business, start another business. Um, I, 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 I gotta get one, you know, wanderlust, get it on its feet, get it going. And then when I have, when I am able to be less involved with it, then I'll take on another thing and, and publicly speaking, I, I mean, I've been doing it my whole life. Yeah. Uh, so I'm into it. Yeah. But I just love, I just love speaking for the, uh, for the one to many. I mean, I hate selling one to one. I'm like, you want me to get on a phone call with you? I'm like, no, Hey, yeah. how about you come to this date? Uh, we'll get all of us together in the room and I'll tell you about what I got to tell you. But um, that's interesting then, man, because what is that? And I'm going to let you go. I want to be respectful of your time here. But when you say I want to get it up and running like successful, like, is there a number? Is there like, um, like, what does that look like? What does that mean? Like for other entrepreneurs who may be listening, what is the point in your, in that business where you feel like, okay, this one's up and running and now we rinse and repeat over here. Um. Well, Robert Kiyosaki de de defines a successful business as one that you can step away for from 12 months and it will have grown when you come back to it. Damn. So that's my uh, definition of a successful business. Okay. Well, I fucking like that. I never actually, I don't know <laughs> if I've caught that one, but like I got some stuff to learn. Mark, it's been an honor having you here, dude. The last thing I want to ask you before we go is what kind of properties does Wonderlust have? Is it Airbnbs? Is it like, what do we got going on here? Yeah. So we manage everything. 
uh, we'll take on an entire apartment complex. We'll take on uh, short-term rentals. We're working on a couple in Whitefish right now. We do it. We put them on Airbnb. We put them on VRBO. I think really the key is we have invested in the software that will allow us to manage your properties across multiple booking agencies. The calendars don't, you know, the calendars all sync up so that we can get you the highest price across the board, whether it's Expedia, whatever, you know, we've got the software to do that. And then I've got all of, between the three of us, we have massive contractor lists, cleaners, electricians. I mean, everything that you need that if, you know, we've got three or four of each, if I can't get your plumber there or you can't get your plumber there, I've got two more I can get there, and which that's, you know, that's huge with yeah. property management. The times of the essence when pipes 100%. break. And, and plus, especially for out of state people, which is what we work with a lot, you need, you just, it, real estate is, it's, it's here, it's in Montana. Someone has to drive by it, look at it, go and inspect it, you know, and that's something that we do do as part of our fee. Um, you know, where are your boots on the ground? And when you're, when you're out of state, when you're down in Texas, California, Florida, wherever, you just, uh, you don't want to be flying up here every other week. No, 100%. I got so many people I want to connect you with, dude. I'm like, dude, I, I'm like, I'm rolling Absolutely. through a list of people in my head. I'm like, I'm one of our guys right now, Bryce McKinley. He's one of the number one wholesalers in the entire nation. They do like hundreds of properties a month without walking any of them. But like, I'm like, I got to introduce y'all. But anyways, that's that's awesome, man. And so it's what I want to say share to our listeners, if you guys aren't following Mark yet, you guys can go follow him on Instagram. You can follow him on Facebook, Mark Sells Montana. And um, dude, I... What I love about him, and I want to tell the listeners who might not say, who you will understand now, but Mark is one of the most unassuming dudes out in the community. And he's, he's everywhere you go. Like you'll be at the store, you're at a networking event, like wherever you're at, there's an excellent chance that Mark Beck's going to pop up. And when he does <laughs> pop up, dude, it's always the biggest smile. It's like the most chill, relaxed, like, hey, what's up, man? Like, I've got a whole bunch of stuff going on today, but I'm really excited to be here with you right now. And I just think that you know, the way that you be, we talked about on your podcast episode, but the way that you be, dude, is like, it's phenomenal. And I know we just, uh, we just met each other, but it's, it's truly an honor to get to meet you, to be on your show, to call you a friend. And I'm looking forward to looking, or looking forward to connecting with you more, but just keep learning from you, man. Like you're just, I love the way you do life. You just make it so like, all right, here we are. I'm taking care of shit. But after talking to you today, it's like, yeah, I'm very nonchalant, but it's because I have a lot of structure and I have goals and I have drive and de dedication and vision, which is yeah. something we didn't talk about a lot today. But dude, it's been a tremendous honor to be here with you, brother. Is there anything that you want to share before you hop off? You know, my number one thing is auth authenticity. Just always be authentic. Be your authentic self. I love that. Dude, you are the essence of that. And that's for sure, man. It's been a, a very incredible pleasure, dude, Mark. Thank you so much. Go yes, follow sir. Mark. Go subscribe to his podcast, Selling Montana, with his co-hosts, Megan and Stephanie. Or go check out our episode. It was a dumb episode. I, I'm so glad they had great. me on. Though. <laughs> we were so far off basis of everything that podcast is probably about. But go check out Mark. Shoot him a DM. If you guys want to do some deals with him, hit him up. He's about making money. Mark, thank you so much, brother. I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, have a good day. Bye, Bye. brother. All right, guys. That has been another episode of The Marshall Gillen Show. If you want to know what we're doing with Top Paid Speaker, make sure you go to toppaidspeaker.com. We'll help you turn your mess into a message and a full-time career, earning you $10,000 to $100,000 per month. And then you can hang out and do things like Mark. All right? I love you guys. Make sure you subscribe to the show. Leave us a review. Love it. Hate it. Let me know. See you guys soon.